to begin with, I was just always curious, did you watch movies or TV as a kid a lot? Were there any, and if you did, were there any that were particular favorites of yours? Or? I um, I loved Tombstone. Mm -hmm. That was my favorite. I would just like start it over again and watch it again. I also used to do that with um, like Grease and Dirty Dancing, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, and then I also was really into um, In Living Color and Ace Ventura, pretty much Jim Carrey or anything. Right. I, as a teenager, young teenager, I just loved him. Um, what else? Yeah, I guess that's an Adam Sandler. Like I always present, like really loved those funny guys, and I and I would just watch the movies over and over and over again. My mom would go crazy. She'd say, "Oh no, she's playing Grease again." I just <laughs> never wanted it to end. <laughs> just rewind it, VHS. And just to put this in a little bit more context, you were. Can you talk about where you were sort of raised and spent what the early part of your life? Yeah, uh, until I was 12, I lived in a little town called Benton, Pennsylvania, and this is very small, very small town. There's like two streets, well, three, like Main Street. Mm -hmm. And then first and second, <laughs> not even a stoplight. Right, right, right. um, but adorable, very uh, Norman Rockwell. I would have a bicycle, I could ride around and and have neighbors and kids to play with. And then my parents got divorced and my mom remarried and moved us to the sticks. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going from like having neighbors and like go knocking on your friend's door, you know, Kim Taylor come out and play, whatever, right. to having nothing and no one around. Um, and I was really bored and lonely, but I had animals. I had cows. Really? Okay. And um, chores and chickens. Uh, I had a moped that I would ride around and just create fun things for myself to do because it was so boring and lonely. <laughs> in, in preparing for this, I got the sense from just reading some of your other interviews that you sort of felt like a, a bit of a social outcast for a lot of uh, your childhood. That you yeah. weren't necessarily in the cool group that you actually got teased for your looks which people might find funny today but can you explain why I was always um, I was always an outcast even in my family like my mom and all of her sisters and my cousins they're all blonde mm -hmm. um, and then on my dad's side like I was I, I fell between the cracks with my cousins because my grandmother would babysit all my cousins but I wasn't really included um, and then in my small town, when your parents get divorced, it was a big deal. Because they were like the first people in the town to get divorced. So it was a lot of like, you know, gossip and right. things like that. And I, again, like just fell between the cracks. I was completely like on my own. I was the only person who had like black hair and weighed 40 pounds. <laughs> and then when I had to move to a new school, so also that's going on at school, like the gossip, like all oh, these people, you know, Kristen yeah, yeah, divorced. Yeah. That was happening when I was in grade school. And then when my parents got divorced, I moved to um, another town, it was a different school, and I don't know anybody. And uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty intense. People would make fun of me for being really skinny. And I filled out, now I'm like a normal human being, but I was just so gangly. And and um, just the way I looked, I was I was made fun of a lot. I had no idea I had, you know, this was ever in the cards for me. And then, so I guess the, the turning point or the awakening for you, I guess, would have been this this trip to the mall, which I hope you can repeat. Yeah. Probably for you're probably sick of it, but it is. I guess that was a. Big it's turning crazy, point. you know, like in home ec and things mm -hmm. like that. You'd go around the room and all the girls would say what they wanted to be when mm -hmm. they grew up, and they all would say they wanted to be a model. And they're like the popular girls. They're like, you know, pretty girls for the right. school. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm not. Um, I want to be. A, I wanted to be a pediatric cardiologist okay. um, because my sister, who's 15 years younger than me, was born with a heart murmur. And so I decided I'm going to be a doctor of babies' hearts. Wow. <laughs> uh, and, and I just wanted to have some purpose. My mom told me when she was growing up that um, people in her high school class committed suicide because they didn't know what they wanted to be. So she told me very early on, like, you're going to be something like this. Or, you know. yeah. um, so my mom was pregnant with my sister and all the nurses started saying, I would go with her to all of her doctors, all the nurses were saying, oh, Kristen should be a model, Kristen should be a model. And we're like, what are you talking about? And then my mom heard about elite model management on the radio coming to the mall. 
And so she was like, we're going to the mall later. And we were, you know, not getting along very well. We're like fighting in public. She, I didn't want to go. I didn't want to make a fool out of myself. And so we went, we like, there was a, a cold contest happening and we missed it. And then somebody came up to me and said, um, like, oh, have you ever thought about becoming a model? And we're like, no. Uh, my mom dragged me to the mall. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's, that's how it all started. And it was such a, a wonderful thing because as a teenager I didn't know what I wanted to do with myself and it was a it was a great way to expose me to the big, big bad world and so you were 15 you said I was 15 that? and then I started traveling um, to New York I was gonna say because now I mean not to be too cutesy about it but I mean it must have been something like some of these girls that are on your show who come here and they're a little overwhelmed I mean, it's, you said you're coming from the sticks to yeah. the big city was that weird yeah I think it was it was awesome. Yeah. Like for me, it, it just immediately I felt like I fit in. Like meeting the other models, they were also kind of like weird looking and tall and skinny, and I was like, wow, this is like I feel more like myself here. Mm -hmm. I loved it. I had no fear. I was really happy to be here. I would do the stupidest things. I like you put yourself like looking back. I don't know how I even survived. I would walk around with like handkerchiefs on and pass it off as a shirt, you know, and you just. Like now, I wouldn't do half the stuff that I did or go out with the people that I just meet people on the street and do you want to go there? Okay, <laughs> just on my own, I'm chaperoned. Uh, but I, I loved it and it, it was it was harder to go home, you know. So I was traveling to New York and then I, when I was 16, I went to Tokyo for the summer. Again, I'm chaperoned. And I was meeting all these like cool people and artists and weirdos and musicians and then going back, Having to finish, finish high school, that was the hard part. Mm -hmm. Being reality, exposed yeah. to all of this, all of this stuff that inspired me, made me feel good. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I just had to get out of there. So, when, uh, when did the transition happen, and how did the transition happen from modeling to acting? Which it's not uncommon, but it's always an interest that you know somebody had. Everybody yeah. has a different. Group. You see, like yeah, a lot of a lot of actresses did start out right. modeling because it's a it's a great way to sort of get your foot in the door. That's all it is, though. You have to, they open the door and you have to walk yeah. through it. Um, and most of the girls that I ran around with didn't continue on or didn't even stay in the industry at all. Um, I was starting. I was feeling really angsty about modeling. You would stand in line for two hours to show people your book for five seconds. And they don't even look up at you at the time. They're just like, eh, where are you from? Okay, thanks. You're like, really? Um, okay. Uh, so then my agency, you bounce around a lot when you're a model because your booker leaves. So I went to Wilhelmina shortly after I leave. And they had an acting division. And they got to know me a little bit when I was in the office. I was very um, energetic. And I was always bouncing up all and telling funny stories and whatever. No, so you, I can't believe that this was. I've calmed down a lot. I mean, I used to just not be able to sit still. Um, so they were like, Kristen, you know, what do you think? Would you want to consider acting? Would you go on a few commercial auditions and see how it goes? So I went on this audition for Dr. Pepper, mm -hmm. and I got in the room, and they were like, So tell us about yourself. So I just started being a goof and dancing around, and I got the job. So that I just realized pretty quick, I'm like watching the girls around me, and if you didn't hit in like two seasons, when you got sent home, you don't come back. And I didn't want to go back. So I, I just wanted to like figure out a way how to you know, stay in New York and do something that I loved. I, then I realized pretty quickly with acting, I had full control over my life. No other actor will ever say that. But I knew I could always work harder and be better and show up more prepared. I had a whole science to like how you have to arrive 17 minutes early to something. If you're 20 minutes early, then you're too eager. But 17 minutes gives you time to like settle, sign in, use the ladies' room, have some water, and get comfortable. And if you're five minutes early, then you're rushing. So I had like, I just got really focused and put my nose to the grindstone. And I guess the other thing that's noteworthy is a lot of people that make that transition will. Try, you know, we'll just cruise on their looks or cruise on something else. But you, you understood, I guess, that you had to take it seriously as a craft because I saw you were studying Meisner. Meisner. The best thing that happened to me because I think I always say everybody should study Meisner and then get into some other stuff because you have these great tools. But then I didn't know what to do with them. Um, 
Meisner really helped me get the focus off myself. And when you're a model, you're posing or whatever. And so it taught me how to listen, and because you're putting everything on your scene partner. So that was the that was the best tool that I had at the best time. So that was the first that was the first thing. And that I was with it. Marjorie Valentine. No, Marjorie Valentine is who I work with now. Oh, She's now. Stella Adler based. Okay. She trained with Stella. Okay. So that is that now how you shift the. Whole yes. Okay. Yeah. So I came out of a Meisner program with great tools, and then she helped me like really learn how to work. Right. And you know work with actions and know exactly what I want, how to put scenes into social perspective and what the big ideas are behind scripts. So she taught me how to how to work but also how to break down scripts. So for a few years there after you started uh, acting professionally, it looks like just, I mean, as an, as an outsider looking at the filmography or the, or the credits list, um, there was a stretch of sort of friends and sidekicks and stuff where uh, I would imagine that as somebody, especially who's taking it as seriously as you were, that might get frustrating. Was there ever a point where you said, you know, is it gonna is it gonna be more than this, or you know, is it uh, is it worth it if this is what it is? You know, just sort of was that frustrating for you? No, I think the only the only time it ever became frustrating was very recently. Is when people, everyone started asking me, like, oh, you're always the best friend. And I was like, it's so weird, because right. I never thought of it that way. Judy Greer says the same thing. Like, that was, she felt that she, yeah. Sorry, yeah, sorry. and it's the same with yeah. Judy, and yeah. she's amazing. And, you know, there was a, a moment where everyone was saying, oh, Kristen's the new Judy Greer. And, and for a minute, I was like, well, I've really only played the best friend twice, and I'm trying to figure it out. And then I saw her in, um, in you know, the Alexander Payne movie, oh, The Sentence, Sentence. Yeah, and yeah. I was like, if they want to compare me to her, great. Yeah. She's got an amazing career, she's got money in the bank, and, and she continues to work. I, I I would get frustrated at first where, you know, you have a girl who has no credits and she gets to be the lead, and I've been like trucking for 10 right. years, and I have to play the smaller parts, and, uh, but then it's like, who cares? I just want to be a working class actor who gets to work. I want to be the 90 year old grandma. I want to be Betty White, right. like, you know, I want to be around forever. Um, but at the time, it was just for me. I'm just about getting work, just taking everything, and I. My whole thing is I couldn't finish a job without another job lined up. So I was more concerned about um, staying on set yeah. than which roles. Now I'm. I have to select better right. because it just gets you to can, a point. Though, so. I, I'm trying. I, I still want to say yes to every single right. thing, but <laughs> that's why you have other people. Right. <laughs> but um, I guess the, like how I approached the early part of my career was say yes to everything, even if it was. I did like background in a music video, like mm -hmm. say yes to everything and work begets more work. Yeah. So that was my approach. What was the highlight of that period when you were, I mean, we, there's big name films and TVs that pop out to, to somebody who wasn't experienced, you know, I, I, as an outsider I would say, I would look at it and say, looks like, you know, she's out of my league, confessing her dreams, yeah. all that stuff, but for you, what was the most, uh, Value. Well, those those movies, you know, it's funny because um, she's out of my league. Took like four years to come out, I think, or something really? crazy. I shot them back to back. I like, they had to work. I was still shooting Shopaholic while shooting. She's out of my league, and even though now it's, it's like they're both the best friends roles, but I yeah. thought that they were so different. I mm -hmm. thought like playing Susan Shopaholic, she was like, you know, ditzy and over the top and bubbly, and I, like she ate paint chips as a child or something. <laughs> and then, and she said of my league, Patty was a total bitch and she was an ice queen and, and cold and what I was doing which was much more subtle. Um, so for me, like those were huge jobs. And it's it's hard to get a studio film, you know? It's it, it's hard to get a movie that will be seen, you know? I, I, I've done other things, it's just that no one's seen them, right. you know? Are, what, would those be more meaningful to you? Like if it, if it was a bigger part in a smaller production that was never seen, would that be more gratifying at that time in your career than being number yeah. two? You know, I don't know. Well, there are reasons to do everything. Yeah. And, you know, obviously if it's an independent film and there's zero dollars and it's down and dirty, you're going to want to, you're doing it because um, you're getting an opportunity you haven't gotten before. So that's important. You know, whether or not something gets seen, you have to still flex your muscles. So it's like acting class. Yeah. It's like, okay, so this is what I'm going to be doing, and you, you get different things out of it. Whereas something like, you know, the show or Shopaholic, like, it helps your name recognition and it helps you get other things. 
it, it's all about keeping the ball moving forward in terms of um, your acting, your the work, and your viability. Because if if you have you have to do the studio films to get the independent films because you can't get them financed right. if you're. No, it's like yeah. chicken or the egg. Right. So when was the first time that you heard about Jane and Margulis? You know, I. It's so funny. I I just like done a string of movies and it was dry out there. Like there were no movies happening and. I was going to do actually an, uh, an arc on um, a, a sitcom, The New Adventures of Old Christine. So I had that offer and my agents told me about the pilot for Breaking Bad. And they're like, they're auditioning girls for this part. A lot of girls, like Juliette Lewis I think wanted to do it, for Bob wanted to do it. Um, I, I, I don't know if that's 100% no. confirmed, but that's what I heard. And they were like, why don't you just go in and see what happens there? It's the best pilot ever. It's a really small show. No one will probably see it, but you'll, you're will you going to like it. It's so up your alley. Because that's more of my style than sort of the girlier, bubbly stuff that, that I also do. Um, so I went in and I auditioned, and I got the part. It was just the old. Did you know it was something special right away? Was it exciting, really exciting to know that you were going to be playing this? Or? I really, I watched the first season, like binged in my bed, like waiting for the audition. And I was like, this show is so cool. Like I just wanted to be in something that was dark and edgy. And I knew the gist of my character. And so I really wanted to do it. And I played a heroin addict before in a movie that no one saw. So I, and I've lived in New York for so many years. I get that, um, not personally, but I've been around it and there are people who have. And I, I just wanted to be a part of it. And I just got so lucky that they let me and that the show ended up taking off in such a big way. When I signed on, like, Brian Cranston hadn't even won the Emmy yet. So I was like, wow, this is great. And the second season, I feel like, really blew up. And, and people are still finding that show. It's like the gift that keeps on giving. And honestly, I'd, I never thought anyone would ever even see it. <laughs> it ended up changing the course of my life I and was career. I say, and, and I mean, so when you were, I guess it was really, it was the, the one season initially, you, you knew it was, that was going to be the stretch of time. Yeah. And then, I thought I was only going to do five, four or five episodes, and I ended up doing, I think, like ten, yeah. so... It was great. And that was just because of the were they getting positive responses or was it or they or was not? No, it hadn't even aired yet. So it was just they saw something. They just you know, and I think even at the end when we were shooting that final episode, everyone was like, "What are we doing?" Like, <laughs> you know, because Aaron and I worked well right, together, right. we had a great chemistry. Um, but I was like busy, so I I didn't even know. I was like, "This is great. I, this is perfect. You get have a, have a beginning, middle, and an end." Right. Well, you um, anticipate though the thing I have to ask you. I mean, the chemistry was. Great, and then you're just that's everything. That's just luck. That's lightning in a bottle. That doesn't always happen. How do you explain it with 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 you guys with that show? Is it just I would in some ways I would think you're coming on to a show that's already done the yeah. season that could either be a really bad thing and these guys you're joining some sort of an operation that's already going, but you obviously made it uh, work very well. How, what, what was I that think probably maybe because they had only done seven, they were right. still like finding their footing and they were open. But yeah, that totally can happen. You show up on a show and everyone, it's like high school. Everyone's right. already set up. They all right. sit at their <laughs> table and you're like, hi. But it wasn't the case at all with Breaking Bad. That's a, that's a great big family over there. Vince just sent me a, a bottle of champagne and, and a letter um, awesome. congratulating me on the show. I, I put it on my fridge. Nice. And he was, was he, people, you know, there are certain showrunners that everybody, you know, they're just getting to the point where they would be recognized on the street. They are the new, like, auteurs of TV. I don't I feel like he's sort of a lower, keeps a lower profile, but he's obviously doing unbelievable things. He does things. keep a lower profile. He's amazing. Like, for him, like, every little detail, he, it's all him. He just, he has a say in everything. I mean, they would take a picture of my belt buckle and send it to him before it went on camera. Like, he was, and I think that's, that's why the show is so great, because it's his vision. So just one last question about that, which is um, when Jane died, sorry guys, spoiler alert, but uh, I mean, <laughs> we'll, I we'll go back and deal. But um, was that, 
difficult for you to, you know, you're saying goodbye to the show, and I don't know if you knew yet what was next. I know that fans were very upset about it. Was yeah. There, how did you handle it? I, I, on the day, like, I knew it was coming up, and I think, like, the, the cast and the crew and everyone was like, oh, it's going to be so sad, and I wasn't processing it at all. I was, like, flying to New York and doing press, and something, it was busy. Yeah. So I didn't have time to really process it. And then when I'm getting in my death makeup, um, I was like, oh, this is so cool. Like, I love, like, looking weird and all of that. So and then I'm walking around, like, with death. Like, um, and it wasn't until we shot the scene where, um, I think it's the last episode, where he's reviving me. They made this cast. Uh, to go around my chest to protect my heart, obviously. And, but they fit it to my stand-in, who was um, smaller than I am. So this thing wouldn't close all the way. Because they have to drill it on and they have to drill it off. It's a whole thing. So it wouldn't close all the way. And so it's pinching me every time he pushes my chest. And I can't get a full breath of air. So I'm like, <gasps> so like trying to get air. And then you have this amazing actor. I'm the most sensitive person on the planet. Like I will watch the news and cry. And so you have this amazing actor on top of you, like pounding on your chest, hysterical, like crying, like he's got tears dripping on my face, um, and it was too, was too much. And then so I'm like, okay, it's this is acting. He's just okay. Don't cry. Just, just, okay, just hold it together. And then I started to think like, oh my god, if I were dead, like, somebody would be like really upset probably. Like this is what it would be. This this is weird. And then not being able to get a full breath of air, how did it happen? What did that involve? Just like we had to stop for about <laughs> for like five minutes. It's like I had to get it off, and I just had to take it. I had to, you know. I think it was also my birthday, um, and uh, it was it was too much. I, I couldn't wait to get out of it. Like that was when I'm like, just get this character away from me, and I can't. Wow. And I just have to mention, I, you don't have to like, give a whole answer if you don't want to, but I thought that it wasn't only Aaron Paul that you know, and Brian that you were so good with. But you're the guy who played your father. Did you that, yeah. Had, uh, that was very kind of searing. You don't forget that some of your scenes with him, but you know, it's funny because in you know with in real life, like we it was icy. It was really? he wasn't like we didn't like bro down right away <laughs> the way that I did like Aaron and even Bob Odenkirk, yeah. who I I'm still, I still keep in touch with. You know, um, but yeah, he was. Kind of icy, and so it was. It was perfect. Yeah. It, you know, sometimes what's happening off, off camera really informs what's happening on camera. You know. So all right, the the, I guess the, main course is uh, now. Where is, don't ask the bee. When's the first time you heard about that? My friend, you know, it was really weird. I wanted to. Pilot season was coming up, and I hadn't. The year before, I did a stars show, and so I wasn't available, and. I made it my mission, like the past four years, to not be available for pilot season. And I just kept getting really lucky that I was either shooting a movie or something else, or I wasn't available, so I didn't have to go through that hell. Yeah. Pilot season is the worst thing. What? I mean, it's great because of all the opportunities, but it's so hard. I did pilot season early on in my career, and you would test for these things, and you get this test offer, and then you would have to like make a deal before you go in, and you're sitting there with all the girls, and it's just the most stressful thing, and then you don't even get it. Like I would test five times before getting a pilot every year, and you don't even get it, and then you go through it again and again and again, and then the show doesn't even get picked up. And it's like you're making yourself absolutely crazy for a job that isn't even real. So I just decided like I can't. I can't put myself through it. Like they say, like the like the most stressful things are a person to go through a divorce, moving, death, and a network test. <laughs> and I believe it. Um, so this past year, I got this little movie offer called uh, for Refuge, this amazing little script that I wanted to do. It was no money. It was in Southampton in the winter. There's gonna be no hair and makeup. I, that's what I wanted to do. My agents were like, "Oh, there's gonna be some good opportunities pilot season." And I was like, "Oh, whatever." I was content doing this like string of independent films. Now I can realize, okay, nobody ever sees those independent films. They do have to balance it a little. Um, so I, I, then I got an offer, like a, a straight offer on a pilot. I was like, oh, that's so crazy. That never happens. Then I got another one. And I didn't realize that people would want me to star in their TV shows. I think a lot of people in the industry are just catching up on Breaking Bad. Um, and it was, I, was, I was available. 
and it was the craziest thing. And so I was like talking to my girlfriends, I'm like, oh, this is so crazy. I don't, I don't know what to do. And my friend Kiwi Smith is a writer, a dear friend of mine. I look up to her and adore her. I'm her biggest groupie. She wrote House Bunny and Ugly Truth and Legally Blonde. She's like the queen of chicky movies. Um, so she read about Don't Trust the Bitch on Deadline. She calls me, she's like, Kristen, I know you're like feeling a little weird about TV, but this sounds really cool and you could be the bitch. So I call my agents, I'm like, guys, do you, do you guys know about this? And they were like, actually, they would love for you to do the show. Can you meet them tomorrow? So I did, and I loved Nanashi Khan immediately. And Jason Weiner, I knew from around. I had auditioned for Arthur, I met him that way, and um, well, we were always threatening to work with each other. I love him. And it, we just had a great meeting, and I left the meeting being like, okay guys, I really want to go do this little indie movie, so can we wrap this up and like make it happen? Okay. And we did. So the question is, would your agents have told you about it if you hadn't asked, or was it another one that would have gone in the pile? Basically, no, they were going to. My agents really wanted me to do a, a, to do the show. They kind of said, because I was still deciding, you know, they kind of said, we'll let you go do Refuge if you do the pilot. <laughs> so I was like, win-win. Absolutely. So, um, I guess, I want to think about how to, how to phrase this, but um, what, you know, what makes somebody think of somebody to play the bitch? You know, I have no idea. Know? Um, I think that their, their struggle with finding a, a, an actress for this part was the likability. Uh, and you can't make a show about a horrible bitch if there's not something redeeming or mm -hmm. something endearing or whatever. They tried to make the show before at Fox and I mean, it was like really yeah. garbage. Um, so I guess they just, uh, that was the only one that they wanted to do it. I wish I would have known that beforehand. Right. So I could have like, pressure. <laughs> yeah, give me 10 million dollars. <laughs> um, I, just, I also didn't realize how much fun I would have doing it. I'm so, I feel so lucky to have such a dynamic character. It's exciting. Uh, well, for, for people who are going to have to catch up on this the way they're catching up on Breaking Bad now, um, could you just give a little sense of, of who Chloe is and what makes her be such a bitch? Chloe is very, she's a sociopath. Mm -hmm. she's comp she has a total screw loose. She has no morals, no filter. She does horrible things to people. She scams people. She's a con artist in fabulous clothes <laughs> and somehow like gets away with all of these things. Um, I just try to bring uh, a positive spin to whatever she does, which I think helps balance out the evil. Right. Um, the show was invented, it was a riff on, now Nashka Khan is a big fan of Breakfast at Tiffany's. So for her, she wanted to make a show about like, where would that character be, Hollywood Lightly, where would she be if she lived in the world? So that was a sort of jumping off point how she developed the show. Um, and I, I love that movie. I love Holly Golightly. I love Audrey Hepburn. So I was like, I would love to play like a twisted, evil version of her. Absolutely. Well, one thing that, that like, if, uh, the most common word, I think, for, that's used to describe you and only a few other people who, who uh, I can think of, you know, maybe Zoe Deschanel and a few other is quirky. And quirky! I, I have to ask you, so <laughs> what do you understand that term to mean, and do you feel it does fit you? You know, what is, what is it about? You know, I guess when, when I watch the show or see myself on camera, I'm like, okay, I get it, I'm really quirky and weird. <laughs> and in my head, I always thought I was really cool. <laughs> you know, I thought, I think I'm cool, and then you see yourself when you're like, wow. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, but I, I think it's because, you know, dark hair, a little left of center, not traditional looking, um, not blonde with giant boobs, so that means I'm quirky, or evil, or a bitch. Well, it, you, everyone has to be put into a box, of course. They can't, so just, that's, they can't just let people be people. Right. Um, so, winding down, just a couple quick things. Betty Davis was... You may have, I'm sure other people have, if you hadn't heard this yourself already, they've quoted it back to you here. <laughs> so, is that, wait, what was that? That's, that's this, my bangs? Is that? No, 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 but that's, oh, okay. what was that? To go, please. Oh, I mean, because everybody, like, I thought you were going to talk about my bangs, but you obviously No, I don't. Know. I would love to talk about your bangs. What, are those, is that something that you've always had, or is that? I have always had them. Yeah. Um, 
and it's only because I can't ever grow them out. They get to my eyes. I try, and it drives me crazy. <laughs> or something happens with continuity on a show or a movie, and I have to cut them again. Right. So I'm like, whatever. Well, um, yeah. Anyway, so you were saying. No, no. Well, the thing with Betty Davis was just that she had. She was once asked why she was so good at playing bitchy characters, and she replied. Uh, why am I so good at playing bitches? I think it's because I'm not a bitch. Maybe that's why Joan Crawford always plays ladies. Um, and so... Oh, she said, <laughs> she said that? that? Oh my god, they, did, they didn't like each other. That's so, so funny. I guess the question... Well, there's also is, some, some story about Betty Davis, you know, where a young actress, like, comes up to her oh, and asks her, like, oh, what, do you, what advice do you have? And she's like, take Franklin. <laughs> in LA, you know, don't yeah, no, drive. No, 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 she yeah. sounds so cool. I would love to hang out she with her. Would, well, it sounds like she. But I mean, is there some logic to that though? That if you are, if you are not a bitch, you can play a bitch easier. You can kind of see what makes other people bitches. I think everybody has a little bit of everything in them, and as an actor, you just tap into different parts. I can be a bitch if I want to. You know, I don't think that I. I'm also like really girly and and. And fun. I love to have a good time. I like to work hard. I like to play hard. Um, so just I'm able to tap into that. And I think because I have dark hair, I get the bitch opportunities. <laughs> and and there was have, have you ever been pressured to like? Do you ever consider changing that? Where you could ever go? You know, some people I think uh, a lot of the famous redheads are not actually redheads, for instance. You know, um, soon I'll be able to because I'll be gray. But. Uh, <laughs> Black hair is really hard to lighten without completely destroying your hair, and I've I've found that this is what I, I get parts looking like this, and I I've tried to color my hair. I, we my hairdresser and I spent like three hours just trying to like sample a back a back piece, you know, like putting developer on, putting heat on it, everything, and then it just turned like the color of this chair <laughs> is not attractive. Um, you know, I, I am excited. I want to change change it up because I'm, you know, when you're on a project for a long time, you get done and you can't change your look when you're on something. Right, right. I'd like to like, really soften it up. For, I'm, I'm as, long as, as long as, as long as. I'm so jealous of the blonde girls because they can like dye their hair dark and it rinses out. Right, right. For me, it's it's harder. But last two quick things: having done a show on cable where you could pretty much do whatever you want now. People, you know, have to whisper the word "bitch" and be have a look over their shoulder, or right. you know, pixelate nudity and stuff like. Right, that. I love it. <laughs> it. I don't really want to be naked, so right, I'm not right, naked. Right. But does it? <laughs> is it? Is it more? Um, does it force you to to? Is it more challenging in a way to have to work within a more restricted setting like broadcast versus cable? I I feel like. I haven't felt that on our show because it is so edgy and yeah. so out there and every week I'm getting the script being like, whoa, <laughs> and we are getting away with most yeah. of it. Like they do some creative editing, like they cut away right before something happens, sure, but I love it. I, I The show is so, per it's so fun. I love my character. I love the editing. I love the writing. I love the cast. I love the colors, the cadence. I think, I just love it. So for me, it's my favorite job so far. I like it better than anything else. Which is good lead in for the last question. You just got picked up again. Thank Congratulations. God you got picked yeah. up. Was there ever, you know, was that ever a concern? Or they, like, I'm sure it's a concern, but was that, were you pretty confident as things came along, have gone along? And then part B, what else, what, what's, what's your outlook for the future? Is this something that you want to do as long as it can go, or do you have other specific things you want to do? I, you know, I want to do it all. I want to direct. I want to do movies. You know, I like. I'm producing something in MTV. Like for me, I just like to do it all. It all, you know. I, I'm. I have a lot of energy. There's a lot of hours in the day. Uh, I really like the show, and I feel like it's exciting and dynamic, and it would hopefully continue to be. If you if you're gonna sign on for potentially a long time, you want to make sure that you're gonna be excited. And I, and I do feel like the writers will take good care of me. So far, so good. So far, so good. I love it. I mean, I just keep it coming. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank really you.